This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 16, Characterization of Linearly Dependent Sets. We've got several objectives for this lecture. First, when possible, we want to determine whether a given set of vectors is linearly independent without solving a homogeneous vector equation. We want to understand the characterization of linearly dependent sets theorem, and we want to understand and apply the linearly independent columns theorem. Recall the definition of linear dependence that we talked about in lecture 15. Given a set of vectors v1 through vp in Rn, we consider this homogeneous vector equation, and we know that that equation always has at least the one solution where all the x variables equal zero. If that's not the only solution, in other words, if this equation has a non-trivial solution, then the set v1 through vp is linearly dependent. But if that solution where all the x's are zero is the only solution, if that's the only trivial solution of this equation, then the set is said to be linearly independent. So our goal for this lecture is to try to understand when a set of vectors is linearly dependent or independent without actually doing the row reduction process that we learned in lecture 15. The reason is because we want to try to apply these ideas to large systems where we've got dozens, perhaps hundreds of equations and hundreds of variables, but still recognize simple cases where we can say that the vectors are linearly dependent or independent without having to go through the computations of row reducing our matrix. This can save us time and energy, which is important for those large systems. First, let's look at some small sets of vectors to try to understand using the definitions when the set is linearly dependent or independent. So remember that the variable p is typically used here to represent the number of vectors in the set, so we'll start by looking at the case where p equals 1. So when we just have one vector, the vector equation we have to consider is just the equation x1 times v1 equals the zero vector. So the definition tells us that if this equation has any solution other than just setting x1 equal to zero, then the set containing v1 is linearly dependent, but if this equation only has that solution where x1 equals zero, then the set is linearly independent. So it all comes down to whether v1 itself is the zero vector. If v1 is the zero vector, then we can put any number in for x1, and the left-hand side will equal the right-hand side. So that means that in this case where v1 is the zero vector, the set containing v1 is linearly dependent. But if v1 is any other vector other than the zero vector, then the only solution to that equation x1 times v1 equals the zero vector will be to set x1 equals zero. Nothing else will work. And that means that this set containing v1 is linearly independent. Okay, now let's consider the case where we have two vectors. In this case, the vector equation we have to consider is a little bit more complicated. It looks like x1 times v1 plus x2 times v2 equals the zero vector. And again, remember the definitions. The definition says that if there's any solution other than just setting x1 and x2 both equal to zero, then the set is linearly dependent. But if that's the only solution, if the only way to make the left-hand side equal the right-hand side here is to set the variables equal to zero, then the set is linearly independent. So how could it be that x1 times v1 plus x2 times v2 could turn out to be the zero vector without those x's equaling zero? Well, let's imagine that it happens. Let's imagine that we have c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 equals the zero vector, where c1 and c2 are not both zero. Well, what we can do is subtract c2 v2 from both sides. That gives us c1 times v1 equals negative c2 times v2. And now we can divide both sides by either c1 or c2. We know that c1 and c2 are not both zero. We don't know which one of these is non-zero, but one of them is. And so if we do that, we either get that v1 equals negative c2 over c1 times v2, or that v2 equals negative c1 over c2 times v1. But that means that one of these vectors is a scalar multiple of the other. And that turns out to be the key observation that's going to tell us when this set containing two vectors is linearly independent. So the set is linearly dependent if one of the vectors is a multiple of the other. And equivalently, this means that the set containing v1 and v2 is linearly dependent if those two vectors point in the same direction or opposite directions, or if one of the vectors is the zero vector. Now that set containing two vectors is linearly independent if neither vector is a multiple of the other, or equivalently, that that set is linearly independent if those two vectors are both non-zero and they point in different directions. One of the things that we noticed in the previous example is that when we have two vectors, that set is linearly dependent if and only if the two vectors are multiples of each other. So what this theorem says is that in a possibly larger set of vectors, if one of the vectors is a scalar multiple of one of the others, then the set is linearly independent. Let's try to understand why this theorem is true. 
So to illustrate the idea, let's remember an example from lecture 15. In that lecture, we considered a situation where we had a set of four vectors where we knew that v3 equaled 4v1. And in that example, we learned that we can construct this dependence relation, which shows that this set is linearly dependent. Now, this might not be the only dependence relation that exists among these vectors, but we only need one dependence relation to show definitively that a set of vectors is linearly dependent. And this illustrates the idea of what to do when we have a larger set of vectors. Now, when we have a set of three or more vectors, the situation is, in general, more complicated than the simpler examples of one or two vectors that we talked about earlier. And the previous theorem tells us that if one of the vectors in the set is a scalar multiple of one of the others, then the set is linearly dependent. But it's possible for a set to still be linearly dependent even when none of the vectors in the set is a multiple of another. This is a really important idea. What is true is that in a linearly dependent set, one of the vectors in the set must be a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. Let's use some visualizations to try to understand this. So in this case, we have three vectors in R3 that all lie in a single plane. Notice that all three vectors point in different directions, which means that none of the vectors are scalar multiples of any of the others. And since v1 and v2 span a plane, it must be this plane that we're seeing here. And since v3 lies in that plane, that means that v3 is in the span of v1 and v2, or in other words, that v3 equals a linear combination of v1 and v2. So v3 equals c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 for some scalars c1 and c2, and we can rewrite that into a dependence relation. Those scalars are not all zero. I don't know what c1 and c2 are, but negative one is definitely not zero. And so that's a dependence relation, and so these vectors are linearly dependent. In this example, again, we have three vectors in R3 that all point in different directions. But this time, the three vectors do not all lie in a single plane. We see that the purple vector does not lie in the plane spanned by the blue and red vectors. We also see that the red vector does not lie in the plane spanned by the blue and purple vectors. And the blue vector doesn't lie in the plane spanned by the red and purple vectors. That means that none of these vectors is equal to a linear combination of the other vectors, which means that there's not going to be able to be a dependence relation among these three vectors. So this is an illustration that shows that even if none of the vectors is a multiple of any of the others, the set could be linearly dependent or independent. We're going to have to do some further investigation to understand what's going on in that case. Now this theorem codifies some of the ideas that we've been talking about. This says that a set of two or more non-zero vectors is linearly dependent if and only if at least one of the vectors in the set is a linear combination of the preceding vectors. So this means that if we want to understand whether a set is linearly dependent, we can walk along that set one vector at a time, checking whether the vector that we're looking at is a linear combination of the vectors before it. If that ever happens, then that means that the set is linearly dependent. If any of those vectors is a linear combination of the preceding vectors, then the set is linearly dependent. But if that never happens, if we get all the way to the end of the set and none of the vectors was ever a linear combination of the vectors that came before it, then the set is linearly independent. So let's try to understand the proof of this theorem. First, let's understand what happens if the set is linearly dependent. So that means that there must be a dependence relation, c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 plus plus plus, that equals the zero vector, where the ci are not all zero. Again, we don't exactly know what these c's are, but all we do know is that they're not all zero. So let's try to identify the last weight in this linear combination that is non-zero. We know that at least one of them is non-zero, so let's find the last time that that happens. So that means that all of the weights that occur after ci must be zero. Now ci might be cp, ci might be the last scalar in this linear combination, but wherever it is, we're just gonna call i that place where the last weight is equal to zero. So what we know is that ci is definitely not zero, but all of the weights after it are zero. So we can eliminate the weights that are zero, so this simplifies our equation a little bit, and then similar to the example that we did with two vectors earlier, we're going to subtract ci vi from both sides. And then since ci is not zero, we can divide both sides by negative ci. That gives us vi equaling a linear combination of the vectors that came before it, and that completes this part of the proof. Now going in the other direction, now let's suppose that we have vi being equal to a linear combination of the vectors that came before it in this set. So that gives us this equation and we can subtract vi from both sides. So that gives us what looks like a dependence relation, but we're missing all of the vectors that come after vi in this set. Well, we can add those back in with zero weights, 
We don't know what all these c's are, but we know that negative 1 is definitely not 0, so that means that this is a dependence relation, which means that this set is linearly dependent. Let's consider some more theorems. This one tells us that if our set contains more vectors than there are entries in those vectors, then the set must be linearly dependent. Another way of saying this is that if we have our set v1 through vp in Rn, then this is linearly dependent if p is greater than n. So to understand the proof, let's suppose that that happens. Let's suppose that we have a set of vectors v1 through vp in Rn, where p is greater than n. If we think about the corresponding vector equation, remember that's what linear dependence is all about, is understanding what's going on with the solutions of that homogeneous vector equation. The coefficient matrix of that vector equation is going to have p columns, because it has one column for each vector in the equation, and it's going to have n rows, because these vectors are in Rn, so each of those vectors has n entries. So that matrix has n rows and p columns, which means it has more columns than rows. p is greater than n. There's not room in this matrix for each column to have a pivot, because each of those pivots has to also be in a different row. And since we have more columns than rows, we'll have to have at least one column with no pivot. And since we have at least one column without a pivot, that means that this equation has at least one free variable, which means that this equation has non-trivial solutions, and so the vectors must be linearly dependent. Here's another theorem. If a set of vectors contains the zero vector, if one of those vectors just happens to be the zero vector, then the set is linearly dependent. So let's suppose that vi is zero. Again, one of these vectors in this set is zero, and we want to try to understand why the set then must be linearly dependent. Well, how could we construct a dependence relation in this case for this set of vectors? Well, we know that vi is the zero vector, which means we can put any scalar in front of vi and the product will still be the zero vector. And so if we put a one, for example, in front of vi and zeros in front of all the other vectors, this will add up to the zero vector. And because one is not equal to zero, this is a dependence relation. And so that shows that the set is linearly dependent. Another important theorem is the linearly independent columns theorem. And here's what it says. It says we've got an m by n matrix, then we've got four logically equivalent statements, which means that for any given matrix, all four of these statements are true, or all four of these statements are false. And hopefully you'll see that these are all just restatements or expressions of the definitions that we've been talking about. Number one says that the only solution of the equation ax equals zero is x equals zero. And that's just writing our definition of linear independence in the form of a matrix equation rather than as a vector equation. So one and three are equivalent. Number two says that none of the columns of A is a linear combination of the others. Well, that's just what the characterization of linearly dependent sets theorem says. And then for number four, we said that the matrix A has a pivot in every column. And again, if we're thinking about that matrix equation, having a pivot in every column means that you have no free variables in that equation AX equals zero, which means that we have only the solution X equals zero. So these statements are all equivalent. And hopefully you remember from lecture nine, the spanning columns theorem, which has a similar structure. And so now we have these two theorems that characterize on the left, what it means for the columns of A to span RM, and on the right, what it means for the columns of A to be linearly independent. We're gonna see as we go forward in this course, how these two ideas are very strongly connected. But first let's summarize what we've talked about in this lecture. Given a set of vectors, there's several ways to determine whether the set is linearly dependent or independent. So if we only have one or two vectors, we can think about what needs to happen for the set to be linearly independent. If one of the vectors is a multiple of one of the others, then the set is linearly dependent. If one of the vectors in the set is a linear combination of the others, then the set is linearly dependent. If we have more vectors than entries, or if the set contains the zero vector, then the set is linearly dependent. So all of those can be quicker ways to determine whether a set is linearly dependent, but we can always go back and use the definition and consider the homogeneous vector equation if all else fails. So these are all basically shortcuts that can get us our answer quicker than the row reduction process, but we always have that row reduction process in our back pocket if we can't use any of these shortcuts in a given situation. We have to be careful. Many of the theorems in this lecture only work in one direction. So for example, if a set of vectors has more vectors than entries, that set is linearly dependent. But if a set has fewer vectors than entries, that doesn't necessarily mean that the set has to be linearly independent. So we have to be careful that we're only using these theorems in the direction that they actually work. If you check the description below, I've got another video where I work through some examples where I apply these criteria to different sets of vectors. So take a look at that if you want to see these theorems in action. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.